Welcome to our second community conversation. This one focused on affordable housing. Um, I'm going to start out by saying we understand we are competing with what's been labeled a presidential debate, but it was more like a couple of kids and one kind of mean kid in a playground, if you want my personal opinion. So if you'd like to watch that, that is uh, more than fine. We are going to try to conduct ourselves uh, in a professional and reasonable manner. And if you can't watch live, we'll be recording this and you can always send your questions in later. Thank you to the council people who are on screen. Thank you to our panelists. Uh, just a little bit of a real introduction about what we're doing tonight, how we got here. Um, we did have our first community conversation regarding the police department um, in early September. We had a lot of participants, a lot of questions and provided some information which the council could then act on at its next council meeting and we did. We asked the staff to go forward with some initiatives uh, regarding oversight, regarding the use of social workers and mental health workers, regarding the use of non-sport officers. And similarly tonight, we have a council meeting scheduled for October 6th. So we hope to have perhaps some initiatives that come out of this, um, but if not, we are definitely scheduled to talk about the town's below market price housing policy, which I'm sure Bill Paulson or Laurel Pavetti will give us some information about. Um, but to go way back, uh, when we started uh, with our Black Lives Matter protests in June, it became obvious that we should have a community conversation about issues surrounding diversity and inclusiveness. Housing obviously is one of those issues that affects diversity and inclusiveness. So we wanted to provide some information this evening, uh, be, available for, be available for questions. And then if there are policy initiatives that come out of this, um, address them at our October 6th council meeting. So please get in touch with us if you can't, aren't able to watch tonight. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our town manager, Laurel Pavetti. Laurel, thank you. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you everyone for joining us uh, this evening. We really appreciate it. Tonight, as the mayor mentioned, is a continuation of our workshop series to continue to listen and learn and understand how Los Gatos can become a more inclusive community for all. And really affordable housing is a cornerstone to how we achieve that for Los Gatos. Um, we have a great panel for you this evening, uh, Community Development Director Joel Paulson, Town Attorney Rob Schultz, Sujartha Venkatraman with the, um, the uh, West Valley Community Services, great partnership uh, in the nonprofit sector, we really value, value that partnership. And so you've got an expert panel that will give you an overview of some of the existing programs that the town has already invested in. And then we'll also talk through some of the new ideas that the town um, is considering, including some updates to our below market price. Uh, attorney Rob Schultz has been very active at the state level with respect to state legislation. So we'll also provide some context to the various issues that are happening within our area. Uh, so that way you have that, that information. Similar to our last workshop, we just have a couple of very simple ground rules. Um, we wanna make sure that this is a very respectful and civil engagement for all of us. It's perfectly fine to disagree uh, with each other. We just wanna make sure that we do it in a way that's not disagreeable to each other. We wanna respect everybody's opinion. Uh, tonight's workshop is focused on affordable housing, so we would appreciate it if your questions and comments could be focused on that particular topic. And then um, we also want to uh, make sure that everyone knows that if you do want to raise your hand and ask a question, uh, we will give you three minutes to ask your question. We also have a Q&A feature at the bottom of the page of the Zoom screen and you can type in your question uh, that way. There's no limit to how many written questions that you ask. However, we are gonna limit um, the verbal uh, participation to just one three minute session per person. So please plan accordingly. So on the screen is just a little bit of an overview of what we're gonna be doing uh, tonight. The mayor did the welcome, I'm doing a little bit of an overview. And then uh, Director Paulson will provide um, an overview of our <coughs> program. Then we're gonna hear about the services and partnerships provided by West Valley Community Services and really understand a little bit more about the clientele uh, that they service here in Los Gatos. 
Uh, Rob Schultz will focus on housing legislation, some recent acts that we all have to follow. And then we'll really open it up to the community. This is where you can ask your questions, provide a comment, share your own experience uh, with housing or provide other input to us uh, regarding the initiatives or even new ideas. Uh, then we'll wrap it up and we'll uh, remind you what some next steps are in terms of continuing uh, the dialogue with the town. Uh, we are, as the mayor said, very action oriented. So October 6th is going to be the time where you can come back and ask the council to take specific action on some of the ideas you've heard tonight. So with that, let me ask uh, Director Paulson to give us a brief overview of our history with affordable housing and, and where we are as a town. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ms. Brevetti. Uh, Mr. Andrews or Ms. Neese, if you could put up the slides, that would be great. Next slide, please. So Laurel mentioned, um, I'm Joel Paulson, the Community Development Director for the Town of Los Gatos. She mentioned the overview. We'll discuss a little bit about what affordable housing is, what the town has been doing uh, to create affordable housing within our jurisdiction, and then what some of the new ideas that we're considering as part of our general plan update um, and other mechanisms. Next slide, please. So this slide gives you an overview of the household income levels for various uh, affordability levels based on the number of persons in a household. The median income as highlighted for a four person household in Santa Clara County is $141,600. As you'll see on the left side, um, the, the main categories we look at when we're talking about affordable housing are extremely low, very low, low, median, and moderate. Next slide, please. So obviously there's a number of um, sectors who would qualify given the income levels of those various uh, household sizes. And here is a list of some that um, we've provided just as a, an example. There's obviously many other uh, folks that would qualify um, on here, things such as teachers, uh, construction workers, health workers, service workers, uh, retail clerks, um, stylists, firefighters, and obviously a number of public employees as well. Um, so those are some of uh, just a short list uh, that we provided as far as who would potentially qualify depending on their household size. So one of the things that we're looking at now as part of our general plan update is uh, what people refer to as missing middle housing. So this is housing for folks who make too much, uh, who have too high of an income to qualify for traditional affordable housing, but they may not make enough money to rent at actual or buy at actual market rate uh, prices. And what we look at here um, as, as we're moving on to the next slide, but missing middle housing, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, later but it's generally trying to accommodate more than one unit in what would otherwise look like a traditional single family residence. So some of the programs the town has is our below market price program, which is an inclusionary program that the town has where we require um, developers to provide affordable housing uh, depending on the size of their development. Uh, we have recently approved a teacher housing project on a property here in town that the town owns, which will end up uh, providing four units for teachers. And then the other big component for the town is accessory dwelling units. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Next slide. So inclusionary housing, which is our below, below market price housing program. Um, generally the town's range is from 10 to 20% of the units uh, on the site must be affordable and again that is dependent on the size of a potential or proposed project. Our guidelines look to integrate those into the overall development so that you don't have a development where it's um, clearly obvious that you know you have larger homes and then you have a BMP which is significantly smaller. So the town does work hard to try to make sure that those are integrated into the overall development. 
And the town generally deed restricts most jurisdictions, depending on whether it's rental or ownership or 45 or 55 years. Most of our units are actually in perpetuity. So um, we generally try to make sure that that low income status is gonna be maintained throughout uh, the useful life of any structure. And we have both rental and ownership units in the town. So these are just some numbers um, of what those programs and other opportunities have presented. Um, so far, the town has 119 rental units that are deed restricted, 55 for sale units that are deed restricted. We have 49 units that will be part of the North 40 that will be for very low income senior, and those will be rental units. In addition to those units, we have a number of developments where um, nonprofit or affordable housing developers have produced units in town, and those come up to approximately 191 units, but they are not necessarily deed restricted. So as Laurel mentioned on the 6th, we'll be talking about our below market price program. Some of the proposed changes are reducing um, the in lieu fee options for developers. Um, we have done that incrementally over the years, but this will uh, make it even more challenging uh, to get the in lieu fee option. And really the goal is we want the units built. Um, when redevelopment agencies went away, that was a large source of a lot of jurisdictions affordable housing opportunity money. Um, and so it really is important that we have units built so that people can occupy those. Otherwise it takes the town a long period of time to accumulate those in lieu fees and really make them um, produce a significant number of units. One of the other changes that we're looking at is incre increasing the re re rental income level from 80% to 120%. This will open up the pool um, a little bit larger and allow other folks who would not otherwise qualify for the rental units uh, to rent those units. And the rental rate would remain at the 80% level, even if someone was making 120% level. So that will be discussed among other things at uh, on October 6th by the town council. This is just a photo we put in here. This is the Ditto's Lane site, which will contain four units. Um, it will be two main units and two accessory dwelling units. And those will be specifically for uh, affordable housing for teachers. So I mentioned before, another big component is our accessory dwelling unit component. You know, the, the town has over 400 accessory dwelling units. Um, in its inventory, um, and the vast majority of those units um, are due to a program in the mid 80s that the town had where they allowed folks to uh, legalize existing units or grandfather other units so that they could be used as accessory dwelling units. Now, state law, as I'm sure um, folks who are watching or um, who may be on the Zoom call tonight, um, state law has been evolving significantly on a number of fronts relating to housing. Uh, but one of the significant uh, increases that we've seen is relating to accessory dwelling units. And um, we have, the town council has been very uh, proactive in not only meeting the state law regulations that have been modified, but also in certain instances, they've gone above and beyond what's required by the state law. And so just as an example, in, in 2017, uh, the town approved four accessory dwelling units. In 2018, which was the first big change for accessory dwelling units, we had 41 uh, units in planning application. And in 2019, we had 51 units. But some of the general parameters with accessory dwelling units, you know, virtually every residential lot can have up to one ADU that's potentially up to 1,200 square feet, and we do actually allow an FAR bonus um, to, uh, to allow up to that 1,200 square feet. But in addition, recent state law also said that jurisdictions also need to, to allow a junior accessory dwelling unit up to 500 square feet. So potentially every single family residential lot in town could have what amounts to three units um, given what the current state law is. So the town is going through our general plan update currently. 
Um, if you want more information, I believe we'll have some of that information on, on a future slide, but losgados2040.com. Um, and so we are looking out into the next 20 years to the year 2040, and we are looking at doing modifications to help increase the opportunities to develop housing in the town. Some of those changes are increasing our density ranges uh, across the board, frankly. Um, we're allowing, again, the ability to do more than one unit within the footprint of a single family home, getting back to that missing middle housing. Those are some ideas we're looking at. We're also creating more mixed use opportunities in some of our commercial corridors, which would allow for commercial uh, development on, a, on the ground floor, for instance, and then residential units above that. And increasing those densities, and then the, the last bullet is increasing the height, hopefully will allow for some very creative solutions that might lead to uh, smaller units, which by and large will be far more affordable than generally single family units in the town. So we're hoping that some of those will provide great opportunities moving forward uh, into the years to come. And so next steps, I don't know if you want to hold off on this one, Laurel, to the end, but or I can walk through this as well. So again, as we've mentioned, the council will be considering the below market price program on October 6th. They'll also consider ideas from this workshop. And as I mentioned before, uh, you can visit the losgados2040.com website. Um, and we definitely encourage everyone to participate because this really is going to set um, the parameters for development and many other uh, issues that need to be addressed for the next 20 years. Uh, additionally, on November 5th, the General Plan Advisory Committee is going to tentatively consider the draft land use element. This is where a lot of uh, the housing policies and goals um, outside of our housing element will be located and that really will influence our next housing element update as well, which needs to be done by 2023. And with that, I will hand it back to Laurel to introduce to Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Director Paulson. That was great. Um, I'd like to now introduce our Associate Executive Director for West Valley Community Services, Sujatha Venkatraman. Really an honor to have you here. Um, the town has been in partnership with West Valley Community Services for many years. And it's a critical partnership uh, with our nonprofit sector. And you've worked specifically with the Los Gatos clients as well as clients in other West Valley communities. And I think it would be really helpful for our audience to understand what, who are the people that need services and what are the services that West Valley assists with. Thank you. Thank you, Laurel. Um, yeah, we this partnership is very critical, um, and we um, we appreciate um, you involving West Valley in this discussion. Um, um, as you all know, West Valley Community Services has been um, the uh, basic need provider for the town of Los Gatos. We serve the West Valley region for 48 years now. Um, we have about 200 households from Los Gatos who access our food pantry. Uh, whether it is our Cupertino location um, or our mobile food operation that comes to the town of Los Gatos. Uh, we serve um, a, a wide range of clients, starting from clients who are homeless, unhoused, to clients who are housed and who have jobs and um, who are still struggling. Um, you know, Joel just presented the, uh, the income um, category. 80% of our clients fall under the extremely low income. So for a family of four in that extremely low 30% is something like 47,000. That could be anybody who has, uh, who's a gig worker, who's a restaurant worker. Uh, gig workers mean Uber um, drivers um, or they are doing Uber Eats um, um, or it could be um, someone who works at the restaurant. Um, hairstylist, um, you know, a person who's doing service sector jobs, um, a clerk at a grocery store or a store uh, or a regular store. So, so we have a wide range of clients from uh, clients who are unhoused, homeless to clients who have um, families with children. Uh, we serve uh, single adults, we serve couples, we serve seniors. Um, so our clientele is 
is, is wide range and um, everybody's need is different. Um, if you look at just Los Gatos demographic, I'm just gonna pull that, I have it written here, about 57% are single adults and majority of them um, access our food pantry services. Um, then we have 26% of households with children. These are families who are more connected with either our rental assistance program, our utility assistance program, even our special program like back to school or our holiday program. All these services um, provides them what we call as asset preservation. When I say asset, it's income. So we try to preserve their income so that they are able to um, access our services, whether it's food or our special programs, and then use that savings for their rent or other emergency. So slowly uh, with families connected to us, we build their savings um, either like by not having debt or by um, accessing the food pantry where they can, if they access it regularly, can save up to 300 to $400 towards their grocery bill. On top of that, we try to connect them with uh, other public assistance or benefits like food stamps and medical. So in combination of all these supportive services, a family is able to then pay towards their rent or their fixed expenses. Um, and um, are not behind on rent or are in, in a situation of um, evictions or can still afford to live in, in, in Los Gatos or any of our service areas. Um, again, what has been critical, and then we also have like 17% of adults who are couple, and typically these are the, in, for Los Gatos senior adults who are on fixed income. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we see this in our cities where Someone could be asset rich, meaning they have a home um, and that they had bought it and um, no loan on it, but cash poor, where they don't have a, an income that's steady or an income that doesn't change at all, especially when someone is on social security income or disability income. Um, so those are the clients we support. So the client, I mean, sometimes we, uh, you know, there's questions asked like, who's poor in Los Gatos or who is, these are, if you look at it, poverty looks very different in West Valley cities. It could be someone who has a job, who's a clerk um, at a store um, and could still be needing assistance. It could be someone who's retired uh, from service, whether it was a teacher or a custodian, and then now they live um, in um, Los Gatos, but can access our services because their income is not changing, but expenses are. So, um, I mean, as you see, our services include a full scope of, um, um, you know, uh, assistance. It's food pantries are most critical um, assistance that we offer, but with food pantry, we also make sure that the clients are connected to other public benefits, whether it's food stamps or free and reduced lunch programs for families with children. We help them uh, fill out these applications because these applications can also be tedious. Um, we also offer case management. So we work with some clients who need more than just these one-time support, who needs constant um, interaction. We try to find uh, jobs for them or even affordable housing or try to put them on a below market rate uh, um, housing program or teach them about these opportunities when we see that they are paying, eight, like they're paying more than 80% of their income on rent. Uh, which we now know that it's not affordable for them. Um, and if there's a crisis, then these are the clients who um, land up getting evicted um, and, may, and that may result in homelessness for them. Uh, we also offer other services like financial coaching. We make sure that the clients, uh, when they are coming to us, they, um, they have other resources to tap into. So we try to teach them on um, going into non-predatory loans. A lot of our clients go for um, advanced cash um, or, um, you know, uh, and, and what that does is they're paying more interest and they get into uh, more debt. Uh, bank overdraft fee, we try to get them from that behavior and teach them of right banking, um, debt consolidation. Um, some clients use a lot of credit cards and think that that will help them resolve a crisis but that lands up into more financial um, crisis in the long term. Um, we do free tax preparations for um, uh, folks who are low income. 
um, and also um, offer special programs, which is like back to school or gift of hope, which um, helps them to not have that expense. So this year we did back uh, um, our back to school program. Uh, we saw um, a huge increase from last year. Overall in our services, we have seen about a 400% increase because of COVID and since March, um, we are seeing more and more families who have had jobs accessing services for the first time. In fact, in Los Gatos alone, we saw about 160 households who are new, and that was since March to now, um, who've not wanted, who's, they probably uh, were, uh, either didn't know about it, our services, or didn't need it. Uh, but be because of COVID and loss of income, they are con getting connected to us. Uh, we also saw um, an increase in financial assistance since March. Um, and Los Gatos alone, about 50 uh, households have accessed financial assistance, and this is rent payment. Um, and people have asked me this question, why rent payment now when there is no eviction? Uh, we try to see that as debt. Um, they will have to pay rent uh, or the debt that they are carrying to, to their landlord. So we try to uh, reduce their debt and start paying their rent um, so that uh, when it comes, when the moratorium is lifted, um, they're not carrying this debt. So a lot of our work that we do um, is around asset preservation and debt consolidation and eventually teaching clients um, savings behavior. Uh, but as you know, with our in our cities, um, it is very critical for us to make sure that the clients are connected to services, food and housing. Um, and this conversation about affordability is so critical because the families in need um, would really benefit from having um, housing or programs um, that are easily accessible and affordable to them. And um, housing is so critical. Um, so, Laurel, that was my presentation. If you had any questions or anything I can answer. Thank you. I think we'll be getting questions uh, here very shortly. Um, thank you very much. It's a great combination of services uh, that you offer. Thank you. And it really helps paint the picture that we do have poverty here within our town. So thank you. Uh, with that, let's turn to our town attorney who's been very active at the state level and really following the bills that have been going through Sacramento in the last couple of years and really provide a framework for local government. Um, so let me turn it over to town attorney, Rob Schultz. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, so I think we can all begin with the understanding that we can agree on that housing, affordability and homelessness are probably the most critical issues facing California cities and towns. Uh, as Mr. Paulson explained, you know, we, we lay the groundwork, we uh, amend and enact ordinances and our general plan to try to provide for affordable housing and, and to deal with these issues, but we really can't do it alone. We don't have that ability to do it alone. In fact, I continually state that probably the biggest impediment that's occurred in the last 10 years is when the state abolished the redevelopment agencies in 2011. Uh, that legislation and the abolishment of that wiped out really our only source as a town and a city uh, that providing an ongoing revenue through property taxes that allow us to, to do affordable housing. Um, for the past, I think, four, five, six years, I've served on the what's known as the Housing, uh, Community and Economic Development Policy Committee for the California uh, State League of California Cities. Uh, this policy committee meets uh, four or five times a year, and it's 45 elected and appointed officials, and we review proposed and pending legislation related to the general plans and zoning and housing and rent control, uh, subdivision map act, and we review all of those legislations that are pending, hundreds and hundreds of bills that come across, and then we make recommendations on whether the, the League of California Cities should support or oppose those mat bills or oppose uh, unless amended. So there's quite a bit of debate and deliberation that we go through. Uh, in 2020, our number one and two strategic priorities on that committee, and I'll read it, was to improve the supply and affordability of housing and advocate for increased funding 
and resources to prevent homelessness and assist individuals experiencing homelessness. Um, so for the past four or five, six years that I've been in on this, I've seen just hundreds of bills dealing with affordable housing. The one exception was this last year. Um, the state legislation did absolutely nothing uh, with regards to uh, housing bills because of the COVID. Uh, today was my one of my last sessions this year with this committee and the executive director for the, the California cities complimented us and I was, will share that with you in that when COVID came, the federal government went on recess, the state government went, went on recess, but she congratulated all of us for local government keep going on. We, we, we handled it, we got back online, we didn't go on recess and, and we continued to do our business as necessary, but the state didn't. So there was, there was no bills this past year that dealt with COVID, but I will go over the bills that were passed from 2016 to 2019 that really have shaped and, and, I, and we all are assuming will come back in this next year uh, when the legislation up in Sacramento is back in session. Um, and if you could go to the next slide, the categories basically are in four, three different categories that they do uh, housing uh, and affordable housing bills. And they'll be in funding, streamlining and local accountability. Uh, there is just hundreds of bills and I could probably go all day on, on all of them. So I'm only gonna go over some very major ones primarily dealing with these three issues. Um, the first two uh, deal with funding uh, mechanisms. So SB2, the Building Homes and Jobs, is supposed to generate hundreds of millions of dollars for affordable housing, supportive housing, emergency shelters, transition housing. And the way this bill is funded is whenever there's a transaction uh, of sale of a, a real property, part of uh, the real estate documents require a $75 to $200 to go towards this fund. So it's not taxing individuals, but it's, it's raised through the sale and purchase of property. Uh, SB 50 is another funding mechanism that provides fundings to cities and towns or counties to adopt a specific housing development plan that minimize project level environmental review. Uh, so that's where you've got grant dollars that you can obtain to try to go through that process to develop a plan. Uh, next slide. SB 35, these, all three of these bills are, are again, go towards that streamlining process that I, and, and barriers to, to stop, that try to stop housing construction. SB 35 allows for streamlining the entire project and really makes pro certain projects ministerially approved, which means it doesn't go through a discretionary approval. It's ministerially means you must approve them. And it's usually only allowed in jurisdictions that has failed to produce its share of the above moderate uh, arena numbers that are required. Uh, and it allows them to uh, increase the density if they qualify for SB, uh, but they do have to provide certain amount of affordable units. Uh, Valco is, is the one I think that many have heard that's occurring in Cupertino um, and is using this SB 35 to streamline a very, very, very large project. Um, SB 33, uh, 73 provides financial incentives for cities and towns to create what's called a zoning overlay district with streamlining zoning, um, which normally would not be allowed without that bill. Uh, and then, you know, AB 678, 167, and 1515, I smile because they were actually pretty much a direct result of our denial of uh, the uh, North 40, um, the legislation used us as an example because we had denied that project to straighten the Housing Accountability Act. They made the standard much more uh, stringent uh, and documentation that's necessary for the proof uh, necessary is substantial evidence instead of a preponderance of the evidence that must be provided if you're going to deny a housing accountability project. It also requires the court if you are found that you denied a project and you shouldn't have, it, it requires, it's mandatory that the court fine a town or city uh, $10,000 per unit that uh, was on the project. And it also automatically now requires 
attorney's fees uh, to be re awarded, whereas in our case, we were able to defeat those attorney's fees. So those are directly related to actually our case that we had here in town where the legislation had responded to that. Uh, a couple other ones is, is density bonuses have been in, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, let me see, that's 68. So we, do, we, we did the accessory dwelling units. Let me see, where am I here? Okay, yes. The accessory dwelling units is the AB68, and that's where I was a little confused. There's also, there's more than that. It's actually AB68, 587, 670, 671, AB881, and SB13. All of those dealt with accessory dwelling units. The legislation has passed many bills on jurisdictions, and, and the reason why is because they felt that many jurisdictions weren't allowing accessory dwelling units because of the nimbyism, and so they have significantly limited our jurisdiction's ability to restrict the development of ADUs. Under these bills, we must ministerially approve them. Again, we don't have discretion. If they are detached, if they're less than 800 square feet, if they're shorter, the height is less than 16 feet or at 16 feet, and there's at least a four foot square foot, a four foot setback in rear and side yards, uh, we don't have any discretion. We don't have the ability to deny those, no matter how many neighbors are upset about the circumstances. And also the same thing with a second junior AD unit, if it meets certain requirements, must be approved. It also requires us to approve them within 60 days. And it also now bans, if your homeless association bans accessory dwelling units, those clauses in your homeless association, your CCNRs are no longer effective. Uh, I, and there was even more bills that did not pass, so I'm sure this is still going to be even further legislation to make certain uh, there's, there's no ability for towns and cities to deny secondary dwelling units. The density bonuses, too, there's many bills that are re reviving this and, and, and giving additional incentives uh, and entitlement benefits to developers if they want a density bonus. and. and and waiving certain zoning requirements if you meet certain criteria. Some of those uh, are within a half mile of a major transit stop uh, is, is one of the major criteria that allow you to gain tremendously more density bonus requirements than was previously, previously allowed. Uh, next slide. And then the last two that I'll briefly touch on is just you know the adequate housing element sites. Um, you know, we, we must zone for our arena numbers and in certain sense, certain circumstances, we are required to even do by right development on identified sites. And that's what also happened through us through HCD. They made us um, do by right development on the North 40 uh, for that phase one to make certain that the project would be approved by objective standards. And then the last one is a no net loss uh, requires a city or county to identify you know, low income housing sites. And if we do, if they are not done for that specific purpose, in other words, if they are developed as market rate, then we have to uh, um, designate another spot to make up for that. And that's why they call that, that the no, less, no, no net loss. So that's just a few of the major ones. Like I said, if there's anyone that wants to talk more in depth about those and the many other ones that just come, come up and continually come up, SB 50 from, um, Wiener just always seems to come back up and we're sure we sure we'll see that, which takes away a tremendous amount of local control. Um, so what we've, we've done on that committee at the state level, we know there's just such pressure for housing development. And, and you know, one of our main goals is still to remain in, in charge of local control. Uh, so what I'd like to share next, if we can put up that PDF is, is we got ahead of it and said, let's try to find uh, legislators that will even put in our own bills on what we believe is best for cities that we can do to increase the affordable housing. And this, this is available on Cal City site, or I can send it to you. It's actually two pages, and this is the first, and it's the blueprint for more housing in 2020 that we've been trying to get legislation uh, going that at least we can sponsor our own bills as opposed to bills that we have to oppose because we don't believe we can implement them at the local level. And, you know, as Mr. Paulson went through some of those things we were looking at, what I liked when we were developing in this last, this last year is if you look at, if you scroll down on that, yeah, we're cities and, and I know it's small, but if you can see that right there, stop there, you know, cities will take action to help 
spur pro production? What can we do? And if you really go through this list, I was proud of the channel of Scatos for doing many of these items, or we are looking at them. You know, there's many towns and cities that have not adopted an accessory dwelling unit. In fact, are still applying their old ordinances uh, in violation of state law. You know, streamlining housing approval processes. We've done that in the last year. We have, we have taken many of our applications that go to the um, um, planning commission and, and now change that to a DRC and a, and a much fa faster approval process. But it's something that we're still looking at. You know, we have not looked at establishing a, a workforce housing opportunity zone uh, or a housing sustainability district. So that's one of the things that, you know, we can check off, maybe look at that during the next months. Um, uh, developing objective design review standards is what we're trying to do at this particular time. Um, those are complicated uh, in many areas, but if you help that out and you know the objective design criteria and everybody's on the same, same playing field, the developer knows what's going to happen, the public knows and the town knows, that helps uh, develop housing uh, stock. Reduced development fees. We did that a few years ago, and, and I think we'll continue to look at that as a way to spur uh, housing development. We've already adopted our inclusionary housing ordinance. It might be time in the next you know, few years to relook at that. I'm not sure the last time we did, but that's something we could do. You know, establish a local housing trust. We do not have one, but that's something that we could also look at. Uh, restrict demolition of existing housing stock. We really already do have that. You're not allowed to demo until you have your, your permit to replace that housing stock. Whereas in many towns and cities, you can, you can demolish it and then come back later maybe for a different use and lose that stock. Um, one of the things that I'm you know, concerned about, but at least with one of these on this goals is to lop the four plexes in a single family zones. The reason why the majority in, in this was in there is because under some of the legislation that's been passed, uh, it's possible to put up to six units in a single family uh, zone with accessory units and, and, and junior units. And so a, a middle ground was try to look at something that was acceptable. So we're not looking at that right now, but it's something that's one, on one of these goals that we could do to spur development. Uh, increase allowable heights and densities that Joel, um, Mr. Paulson talked about that in the general plan. That's what we're looking at in certain areas. You know, is, is, it, is it helpful to raise those densities and heights to, to spur that development on? Uh, adopt transit oriented development plans. And we have some of those right now. Um, a couple of those were approved with, with the North 40 and, and we should try to develop those as much as we can for each and every one of our large developments. We have reduced parking requirements, but you know that's not always easy because uh, the perception is is that will create more traffic and circulation problems and bring out many people that will oppose projects. But we did reduce parking requirements on the North 40 in order to provide for more density and make the project uh, viable from a from an affordable housing standpoint. Um, adopt tenant protections. We, we were probably the first in the Bay Area. I get many calls about our rent protection. And uh, we'll continue to uh, do that and look at that. And, and there's with many legislation, although not in the housing area this past year in Sacramento, there was legislation regarding to tenant improvements during the, the COVID-19. And so that's pretty much my presentation. Those last ones that I looked at is kind of a starting point, I think, for the public and what, and what Mr. Polson has brought. There's many ideas and we're looking forward to hearing, you know, the public on what other ideas that they have that we can spur affordable housing and, and, and housing in general to try to meet the crisis that our state's facing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. That was a great overview of the many complex bills that are now enacted and that all local governments have to implement. So thank you. And just for our viewers, please know that we will be posting the slide decks that you've seen tonight as well as the League of California Cities handout that Rob just went through. So that will be, um, be posted uh, for your review uh, at a later time. And before we open it up to your questions and comments, I'd like to recognize our mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Laurel. And thank you to all of our presenters. I, I just wanted to say for those of you who are joining us tonight and may not have participated in housing discussions on any level at the town, be it from the Development Review Committee to the Planning Commission to the Town Council. 
uh, if you've learned anything in the last half hour, what you've learned is that this is an incredibly complicated subject area. It's uh, full of acronyms. What's ARENA? What's a DRC? What's, a, what's an HDC? You know, what are those things? There, there is something that's, we have a state committee that controls things we, that we do. We have a regional, regional housing needs assessment. That's ARENA number that is imposed by our regional governments where we have to plan for a specific number of units, not necessarily build them, though that is getting more and more strict uh, with the bills that Rob has just uh, summarized for you. Um, the idea is to, in the state level, is to reduce housing by, uh, to the extent that makes sense, uh, maybe not for some of our residents, but for state legislatures, to take away uh, some of that discretion locally that ends up uh, preventing development in lots of cases. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that this is really complicated. Um, please feel free to ask questions. If you think of a question later, please write it in. We will answer those things you have tonight. And if you just don't have a question, but you have an observation, we'd love to hear that as well, because we understand that this is complicated and uh, we welcome your thoughts. So Laurel, with that, let's hear from our participants. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you again to our panel. Really appreciate that. And our panel be, will be with us um, all night uh, tonight. So that way you can ask your questions. We do have some questions queuing up in the Q&A. Uh, I will be reading questions from the Q&A. We will not be typing answers into the Q&A. I know there's a couple answers now, which is fine, but we'll be reading those. So that way they get into the record and on to KCAT. Uh, which is broadcasting uh, this workshop and we'll be posting it on YouTube. But I, I think let's start with, um, with people who might want to raise their hand and ask a question of our panel or provide a comment or share an experience with affordable housing or make other suggestions for our town council with respect to policy options et cetera. So I see uh, Lionel Gardner um, as our first and um, so welcome. Hi, how are you? Good, please, please proceed. Yeah, I wanted to ask, uh, are you guys trying to work with other cities uh, that are doing similar things uh, when it comes to housing? Uh, like for instance, ACORN organization that's been working in Oakland who have section eight housing plus commercial uh, housing, um, affordable housing, because uh, it seems like the problem is, is that um, we're all fighting for the same dollars. Each city is fighting for the same dollars. And um, it's only a, the, with that, the, the pie, the slices of the pie for each city gets smaller and smaller. So um, and that's kind of what happened with the Civil Rights Act, 1964, 1965. There was a big pie for the African-American community, then became a smaller and smaller and smaller slice of that pie over time. Um, how do you avoid not making the same mistakes uh, as the Civil Rights Act uh, pie, um, the dividing of, of the resources for that? How do you not make that same mistake when gaining resources for your town, Los Gatos, uh, where maybe East Palo Alto needs the same, that, that same sli a slice, and maybe uh, Saratoga needs a slice, or maybe Oakland needs a slice of that? California pie when it comes to 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 housing. Thank you. That's a that's a great question. Um, I don't know who amongst our panelists might want to start. Um, I can also jump in if that would be helpful just to get the conversation going. Um, so I would say let me just start and then I'm sure um, our other panelists will add. I think to the extent that the town is eligible for some of those state funds, I think we would be happy to go after them, but we tend to be more self-sufficient and utilize our own resources, which is why we have our own below market rate um, housing program. And we have our own below market rate housing fund that we can use for local investments. But your point is really well taken in terms of how do we leverage those limited dollars to really produce more housing for, for all. So let me turn it to our panel. 
So, so I would, I would say, depending on what the services is, you know, yes, we, we all use West Valley services and we have different services at the county, if, if, if that's what you mean, to help uh, with lower income families and all the services that were mentioned. If you're talking about just the development of affordable housing, we certainly work together, as I mentioned, the Committee of 45, and we discuss all the time legislation and the potential. Um, but as far as getting together for the development of affordable housing, I, I think the issue is more if you could transfer your arena numbers somehow to another town uh, and let them use the arena numbers to build. I think many jurisdictions, again, we go back to the NIMBYism, that doesn't want it in their jurisdiction. So they would be looking to offload it in another jurisdiction. And that's what we don't want because then you wouldn't have the diversity. So you want each individual um, jurisdiction to try to build their own affordable housing. Uh, I, I haven't heard of anybody going in together on grants and studies, but that doesn't mean it's not happening out there. And as Laurel says, we seem to be we seem to be self sufficient. We seem to do it on our own. Although it was much easier when we had redevelopment agencies and had those funds. And since those dried up, I think you're correct. I think we do need to look at probably trying to partnership with other jurisdictions. It's just if you're talking about the straight building as opposed to services provided, you know, you get into that dichotomy of of, of which jurisdiction is going going to build it. Yeah, I just want to add to that. I mean, it, it's an excellent question. Um, I think in California as a whole, um, when, when we look at affordability and especially with housing, um, we have to share um, and learn from each other. So, I mean, there has to be collaboration in this. It's it's no longer um, a city town issue. It's a regional statewide issue of affordability. And there is a lot of lessons to be learned of things that didn't uh, work out, whether it was San Francisco, Oakland, uh, Berkeley. I mean, there are um, enough data to prove that when they did things in isolation, how it created a ripple effect and sometimes just affected the whole state. So more and more, I think there is more collaboration when I see um, as an outsider, as a nonprofit looking at city and um, towns working together, even the county. Um, and I, I've been with West Valley for 12 years now. In the last uh, five years, I think there is more collaboration as we've come to understand that um, this is not a city's town problem. This is a, a statewide issue and has to be resolved. And we have to learn um, the lessons from each other and collaborate. And I'd also just add, I think the, you know, Oakland, uh, in a comparison with Los Gatos, obviously those are polar opposites. And some of that just gets back down to the basics of, you know, the cost of land, the lack of availability of land, and then the regulations that the town currently and in the past has in place, which make it very challenging for um, affordable housing to be developed. I think we're moving in the right direction with our general plan update as we look at creating more opportunities. Um, obviously, there's always room for improvement there, um, but we won't be building you know, towers and things along those lines. And from a fund perspective, you know, we are, you know, we are going to be receiving our fair share of the local early assistance program grant funding, which we're going to use to try to implement some by right um, housing standards. We are in a Santa Clara County collaborative, which we work with a lot of the other jurisdictions to brainstorm ideas they're doing. Um, and then look at the, there's another program coming out, which is the regional early action planning, which is more on a regional level. And so we will be participating in that as well. So I think we do look for those opportunities. Um, and we try to collaborate with folks and learn from um, others as they learn from us. And so I think those are important uh, points. And as we move forward, we need to create the opportunities through our regulations to allow for um, more density, for instance, um, to make it uh, more reasonable from a fiscal perspective to develop housing of any kind, let alone affordable housing within the town. Great, thank you. Thank you all and thank you for the question. Let's move on to Chris of Los Gatos, who has his hand raised or her hand raised. Can you hear me? Yeah. 
Okay, um, I'm curious. We, we always talk about ownership of housing and then we do have some rentals that we own, but I have asked this in the past is how many section eight dwellings are in the town of Los Gatos? Do we have a number from the county? Because there are quite a bit of them right around my neighborhood over the years and I know they exist. So my question is, do we have a good number because that's something we can report back to the state because not everybody wants to own a home. And um, I think that number should be also as part of the numbers of what is available for uh, low income folk. Thank you. So I'll just say, I, I don't know what that number is. I'm not sure if anyone else um, on the panel knows what that number or generally what that number is or if it's even um, available. Uh, typically, the Section 8 programs are administered by the county housing authority. They're not administered locally. And so we don't have the ability to track that. Um, I, I think your point is a good one that that does contribute to the affordable housing stock. Um, but we also know that within Silicon Valley, there have been some challenges of landlords who perhaps aren't accepting Section 8. Um, so it, it is a it's a great program, but it is it's got some some challenges um, as well. Um, so I'm sorry we don't we don't have that number, but we'll we'll see if we can maybe get that information and then post it later on on the website. Uh, let's move on to uh, Jeffrey Suzuki as our third uh, live question, and then we'll move to the written questions. Go ahead. Hello, everybody. Uh, this isn't really a question. This is a comment. Uh, I've heard it repeated uh, by many town officials and town council candidates that the BNP program is quite a successful program. However, I ask by what metric? Because if the metric of success is socioeconomic diversity, the BNP has failed. Um, Los Gatos has become increasingly populated by high income white collar professionals. And today, many longtime residents note that they bought a house in Los Gatos with an average working class or middle class income, but would be totally inex inaccessible to them today with that same income. Despite some individual success stories of the BMP program, Los Gatos' BMP program has not achieved its goal of substantially increasing Los Gatos' um, socioeconomic or racial diversity, despite the fact that the program has existed since 1989. If anything, Los Gatos has lost much of its accessibility. Um, it's lost much of his accessibility to working class families and minorities most subject to current and historical economic oppression, mainly black and brown people. We shouldn't be surprised that black people only comprise 1.5% of Los Gatos. This is absolutely unacceptable and our program hasn't worked. In this respect, affordable housing is as much an economic issue as a social justice issue. And I know that the town of Los Gatos rhetorically upholds diversity and inclusion as keystone virtues. However, they cannot be true uh, racial or economic diversity unless a substantial proportion of its affordable housing is affordable. Uh, that's a fact. So what's wrong with our program? First, the, the BNP, in my opinion, places a large emphasis on, too large an emphasis on home ownership as opposed to rentals. Through the BNP programs, homes that would otherwise be worth millions of dollars are um, purchasable, purchasable, purchasable by those who meet the requirements. But there are two main problems with this. One, um, Houses in Los Gatos require $30,000 to $60,000 down payment on affordable houses, quote unquote, um, for a price around $300,000. The vast majority of working class families cannot afford to pay this lump sum of cash and are thus excluded um, because the bottom 50 percentile of Americans, and this might be surprising to a lot of people, but this is according to um, Professor Emanuel Saez and Gabriel Zucman's work in U University of California, Berkeley, uh, basically have zero net wealth. They don't have any money. So we're essentially excluding the very target um, audience, um, the, the very targets of this affordable, uh, the primary targets of this affordable housing. Um, uh, secondly, when you move, when a, a person buys the, ho the house initially um, at the quote unquote affordable rate, um, it ceases to be low income housing the moment their income rises above a certain threshold. Um, and effectively it, it the housing unit becomes redundant. It's no longer affordable housing at that point. And, uh, as for the second advocacy, instead of just removing the em emphasis on home ownership and um, focusing solely on rents, uh, so far, uh, there has been a very clear uh, failure to develop, to create new BMP units. And basically, we have to have in action in the event of an affordable housing shortage be a violation of the general plan. People should be compelled to act because every time we need more affordable housing units, it shouldn't be a long drawn political debate. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, let me ask Director Paulson to just clarify what happens when an affordable unit is occupied, either rental or owner, by a family that may then improve their income status? How do we recycle that deed restricted housing unit to maintain um, the supply of affordable housing? Thank you. So Mr. Suzuki, I believe was speaking about the for sale units and in that he is correct. So someone's income could raise above at some period after they purchase that um, and they can maintain that um, tenancy and, and we do not require them to move. Um, however, when they do move, then that house is required to be sold um, for you know whatever the slight cost of living increase, depending on the number of years and or any improvements they've made to another um, affordable uh, income family or individual um, for, that, for that specific unit. For rentals, that's a little different. Um, for rentals, if a individual who is income qualified for a rental, their income goes above, I, I wanna say 100%, because um, currently we're at 80%, um, goes over 100 or 120%, then that unit actually becomes a market rate unit and they can either choose to stay there and pay the market rate um, or they can then move. Um, and if they do choose to stay there and pay the market rate rent, then the next available unit of similar size be automatically becomes a BMP unit. So we never lose the rental unit. So that's how we recycle those. Um, and Mr. Suzuki also brought up a great point um, regarding the down payment. And that's not something I had listed. Um, that is one of the changes we're looking at. Um, currently our down payment is 10% um, for for sale units. We're actually looking to change that to 3%, um, which would help alleviate some of that. Not all of what Mr. Suzuki was talking about, but um, it would be a significant um, reduction in that barrier for certain individuals. Thank you. And I would just add, uh, Mr. Suzuki, those were great points. And to your point about the actual production of more affordable homes, we really welcome you to continue to participate in the general plan update, especially when we talk about the land use element. I think your ideas about how do we uh, create flexibility within the plan to really encourage housing production um, is, gonna be, is going to be really critical. And so we, we do look forward to your continued participation and advocacy, as well as everybody else who might be interested. So let me turn to the, the written questions. Um, there were three by one particular um, uh, participant. So I'm gonna just read uh, them one at a time. So the question, first question is what length of time uh, we reported the BMP production numbers. What was the length, the time period for that production? Excuse me. So the length of time, I, I believe the uh, first inclusionary housing ordinance in the town was in 76, maybe 79. I want to say 76 though. I think the challenge is that when it was initially and it, it evolved over the years and up until fairly recently, it really never captured standard subdivisions. It only ca captured planned developments. So there was a lot of opportunities lost there over the years. Um, I will get some information as we kind of post responses uh, to these questions online um, to, to get a general idea of when we really started seeing the BMPs come into place. I would imagine it was probably sometime in the 80s um, at the earliest. Um, and so, you know, that time frame is, you know, up to potentially 40 plus years. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, uh, why don't we use tiers of moderate, low, very low and extremely low? I don't know if I um, if I understand the question. If um, so, directly, I, I, I'm not sure I understand the question either. But what I would say is that those specific levels are individual tiers, and they are specified um, by state and probably federal law as far as what qualifies for those specific levels. Um, so maybe we can I can work offline with uh, that individual and, and get a little more clarity, and we can provide that answer as well. Okay, and then just to remind us, our current BMP program focuses primarily on the low and moderate uh, segment. That's correct. Our current BMP program for for sale units 
um, is low and moderate. Our rental um, has been low. And so we do, we are looking to modify that to allow more individuals by increasing that up to the moderate level, which is the 120%. However, those individuals still would pay the 80% low rental rate, so they'd still be low units. Okay, thank you very much. And then the third question has to do with accessory dwelling units and whether or not they count towards our regional housing allocation number. Thank you. So actually in our last housing element cycle, um, the town looked at average rents for specific size units. And uh, we provided that information to uh, housing and community development at the state. So we actually are allowed currently to uh, count those as moderate units. Um, the next housing element cycle, I think that bar will be a little higher um, as a number of jurisdictions have used that. So we'll probably have to do a little more uh, analysis and provide some very thorough uh, justification to allow HCD to allow us to count some of those units. And we may even benefit by looking at some opportunities from a size perspective, whether that's bedroom and or square footage and what those rental rates are. So we might get to count some of those as low as well. Okay, excellent, thank you. We're gonna move back to our live questions. Um, and just a reminder, you know, one, one opportunity uh, for verbal comments, uh, and you're welcome to share a story, give us input on the policy ideas, uh, and then if you have subsequent questions after that, feel free to write them in the chat. So let's turn to Laura Kramer Ramel, and I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Please go ahead. I don't know if we have Laura. It's on my end, Laurel. I'm um, clicking the button to allow her, but it's not working. So Jenna, can you see if you can allow her to talk, please? Same thing is happening on my end as well. Okay, Laura, we will come back to you. Um, I'm so sorry for the technical difficulty. But let's see if we can get Russ uh, to be able to join us. And go ahead, please. Howdy, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, thank you. All right, awesome. So this is gonna be kind of kudos to a comment to a question or two, depending on how I do on time. Um, so first, kudos. Uh, this is super cool. And I wanna thank you all, all the participants and the commenters for um, being here because, um, you know, this is this is a really big deal. I hadn't realized up until fairly recently just how um, dire of a situation this is. I didn't I didn't know how bad the housing unaffordability situation was until you know I uh, I talked to a friend who in San Jose was you know doing some work with the homeless encampment, and she told me you know the dirty secret of this is that half of these people they're not unemployed. They have jobs. They just can't afford housing. You know, um, and when I look at the the scope of the problem, I'm going to ask a question about metrics. Um, like by my back of the envelope calculation, the the median uh, house price to median household income in Los Gatos is something like 15 to one or worse, where five to one or worse is considered severely unaffordable, or at least was before the first housing bubble, right? And so this is this is like catastrophic. This is this is. I don't have words strong enough for this. And so, and to, to further um, Jeff's point, this is a real severe uh, social justice issue, right? We know that in the United States as a whole, um, black families, black households have half the income of white households, that they have, you know, median a ninth the net worth of white households. And so anything that is affecting the country as a whole is going to absolutely disproportionately hammer on black Americans. Right. Um, and we see this. Um, we see this in terms of, you know, Los Gatos's uh, racial composition. It is the, the odds are the deck is simply stacked against black Americans who want to live in Los Gatos or who want to stay in Los Gatos. Right. 
Um, Ibram X. Kendi says that a racist policy is any measure that produces or sustains racial inequity between racial groups. It doesn't depend on intent. It's not saying you are racist. It's just if it's leading to inequity, it is racist, regardless of intent. And so I'm super stoked that you guys are taking a serious, hard look at this because it is amazingly important. So in terms of metrics, you know, I threw out the median household uh, income to property prices. I'm wondering what other metrics you all are looking for. I actually have a few thoughts as to ones you might want to consider. Are you are you looking at, you know, how many, what percentage of people who work in Los Gatos are able to live here or the length of the backlog for some of these public services or public public housing or subsidized housing? Just to, you know, what are what are you guys just looking at to assess the success of what you're doing? Thank you. That's excellent. Thank you. Metrics are, are really important because that way we can really track, you know, what is happening and what what is really meaningful. Um, let's see, in, in terms of the backlog, maybe um, we should start with Sujatha. Maybe you have a sense of what of what you're seeing in terms of backlog. Um, Laura, I just need like backlog with, um, sorry, with what? I think the demand, that we have more demand for affordable housing than, than supply. Oh, okay. yeah, thank you. I mean, that's always, always the case because we don't build um, as fast or we don't add to um, affordable housing uh, at a faster rate that the clients are needing services. Um, and so um, with more um, divide between, you know, like income and cost of living, um, we have, a, if you just look at Cupertino, um, we have close to like 500, 600 applicant and um, the availability is nowhere close to that. So what we do is we put them on a wait list and a typical wait time for a client to get into any affordable housing is anywhere from three years to five years. Um, but what we educate our clients is get yourself on the list because if you're not, then there is a 0% chance. But if you get yourself on an affordable housing list, then there is a chance of getting it. Um, but yeah, the, the, the issue will continue till we add enough affordable housing. So that's the only way to um, come anywhere close to um, not even bridging a gap, but somewhere an acceptable number that we don't have so many people waiting on the wait list is to build affordable housing on a constant basis. And, that, and, and that's a story for all the cities we work in, whether it's Los Gatos, Saratoga, uh, West San Jose, and Cupertino, um, affordable housings don't get built fast enough. There is, it, it's, it's a long drawn process, uh, but clients are falling into um, affordability issues at a faster rate. And so that actually answers one of the other questions, which was what cities are in your service area? So that's West San Jose, Cupertino, Los Gatos, Saratoga, um, and we also cover the um, unincorporated mountain um, region of both Cupertino, which covers the Cupertino Hills, and um, in Los Gatos, um, all the way up to Redwood Estates, um, and uh, that falls under Santa Clara County. Okay. Thank you. And Joel, did you want to talk about how someone could get on our waiting lists for the Los Gatos? either rental or for sale BMPs? Sure, so the waiting list for the rentals are actually currently monitored and held by the property management or property owner for rentals. Um, for the for sale units, those waiting lists are um, held by our uh, BMP housing program coordinator, which is currently Hello Housing. Um, and generally um, they create new lists whenever a BMP unit becomes available. Um, over the last you know, two or three years, we've probably had one or two a year that have come available. Um, we've got, as I mentioned before, we're gonna have um, 49 very low rental units coming up for seniors. Um, and we also have currently one unit that is probably a moderate unit um, that will be coming up uh, that's currently under construction as well out off uh, Union Avenue across from the Safeway. Um, but the for sale units, you know, we really, you have to kind of rotate that list and it depends on a number of factors, including the size of the unit and then particularly the number of bedrooms, because generally we don't want to have, you know, one person in a three bedroom unit 
or you don't want five people in a one bedroom unit. So there, there are some other parameters that we look at, um, but they're always uh, welcome to contact our coordinator. What I will say, and I don't have the, the link to it on a, on a slide currently, but if you go to the town's website, to the community development department, to the planning or to the, uh, yes, to the planning division, um, there's actually a housing uh, page, which has a lot of information about housing and, spe and specifically a housing resource guide that has a lot of information on um, market rate and affordable units in the town um, and, and, a, and a number of other um, sources that, that can get you information. Uh, but generally, like I said, the rentals are held by the property owner. We're looking to have potentially a little more oversight of that um, from our um, BMP coordinator, uh, depending on what happens with the guideline modifications and the for sale units, we get hundreds of applicants every time a unit comes up. Um, so those those lists rotate fairly frequently. Okay, great. But, but, I, but I think also the question was more what's the metric for a successful that our program successful over the years or whether it's unsuccessful. And, you know, what I try to tell people is, and that's what I started out with, you know, we plan for them and, but we don't build them in the normal sense. We're not the developer. And so, as I mentioned, you know, how do we reduce those barriers um, to allow for that? And I, you know, I went through quite a few of those that we are doing and ones that we can do to reduce barriers uh, to the building of it, because we need those. And as, as Mr. Paulson mentioned, we have, we're quite different than other ones because of the the land costs and unavailable land, but then there's other barriers. And, you know, I, I think on page two of that Cal Cities uh, um, blueprint it really talks where we really need to do also is, you know, we need to reach out to the developers. We need to discuss with them what are some of these barriers to con constructing units in our town. You know, is it the height? Even though, you know, we, we are very restrictive on height and we're looking at increasing that height um, but, you know, if, if we don't increase it enough to make it uh, feasible to build affordable housing, then we'll just be in the same position. So, you know, we do need metrics. But again, I, it's just important to remember, we can plan for them, we can create policies, we can reduce all those barriers, but you still need third parties to build them because we don't have the funding or the land to do so. And so... Um, you know, it, it's difficult to make those metrics if you, if you don't have control over them. It'd be great to say we could go out and build them ourselves, and that might be a possibility, but we don't have that ability. So it, we need to find ways to reduce those bar barriers through the state legislation and through town legislation. But I also think we really need to engage with our stakeholders, our developers, and find out uh, why we're having these issues, kind of like we did in the downtown area. You know, we, a few years ago, we found that we were really um, had impediments to attracting businesses in the downtown and we, we had stakeholder meetings and we really found out what those impediments were. And, and two or three years later, we, we really are way ahead now. We, can, we do have some vacancies, but compared to, you know, when I travel, I always go to downtowns. We're doing very well. So we have to find out what those impediments are and then figure out how to solve them. Excellent. Good. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to Ali Miano. Welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for uh, letting me speak now before I run off to teach a class. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, try to tie together some different points that I was able to to pick up on, and I apologize for uh, missing the early part of the meeting. I had to watch the debate in real time. You know, at, at my age, that's that's the preference. Sorry, but um, so uh, to echo Jeff on on the, the thirty thousand dollar down payment for low income folks that. Um, you know, I wish I had that kind of savings and I'm not low income. So uh, I, I don't know how anybody would come up with that. I think lowering it to 3% and maybe even um, getting, uh, thinking of ways uh, to, to help people finance that. Uh, because otherwise, as Russ pointed out, it, you basically have a racist policy. It's a zero sum game because the town of Los Gatos gets to say that it's got 
a policy in place to help people, but it really doesn't help people. Um, and uh, uh, there's something else I was made aware of recently called an in lieu fee that allows uh, builders to postpone and postpone and postpone the building of these, um, uh, the, these units. So that's a huge problem. I mean, we, we, we've got to get rid of these loopholes. And I just want to say, I've lived in this town since 1965. And yeah, I remember when teachers lived here um, and uh, police officers could live here, working folks. It wasn't just a place for you know the, the uh, Silicon Valley boomers. And that's what it has become. And I think if we really want to see you know, the kind of diversity we say we want to see, then we, we've got to, yes, come up with some creative solutions to fix that and, and to make this a place that is accessible to all kinds of people. And, and, and one question I do have, and, um, and then I'll, hopefully you can get to this before I have to go to class, is how are people, what is the process through which people become aware of these opportunities, which frankly so far don't seem that great. The only time I have ever heard of one was through somebody who worked for the town and, and usually after it was gone. Um, so so what, uh, what is the mechanism to make people aware of these opportunities and to help them um, apply? Thank you very much. Thank you, great comments. Um, and I would encourage you to stay engaged with the town. Joel, do you want to talk about how we promote the opportunities when they do become available? Yes, thank you. So those, those opportunities are promoted um, through the town's website and also through all of our social media um, outlets that we have. So we blast all that information out on those. Um, I know, I think historically, and I, I can't recall on the last one we did, sometimes we'll put that into the Los Gatos Weekly, um, some kind of flyer. And then also Hello Housing will do outreach as well. Um, so th that's our mechanisms. I encourage folks, if you're not on the town's social media or what's new, um, because they go out on what's new as well, I encourage you to, to get involved on some of those because that will get you that information, even though, as it was said, those opportunities are few and far between. Okay. And then we had um, one instance where the Mercury News took a significant interest and really helped promote, and I think we have thousands of applicants for yes. one of our BMPs. So, you know, when the news media is, you know, is available to assist us, then we definitely leverage, leverage that as well. Let's take one more raised hand, um, and I see Planning Commissioner Matthew Hudas uh, is, has his hand up. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Great. Um, I, I really believe that it's it's critical for the town uh, to not just survive, but to thrive by increasing our diversity and not just racial diversity, but cultural and economic uh, diversity as well. Um, I had a, a very uh, good conversation with Mr. Suzuki a, a while back and really appreciate that housing is the most critical lever. And um, I appreciated his, some of his ideas about cooperative housing as well. Um, the, 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 you know, there's the planning and there's the doing, right? And the planning is focused on getting numbers and turning them into some place where housing could get built. And I really think that before we get started with the 1,950 number that's coming down, that we address the principles by which we decide uh, where to put housing, reflecting equity and neighborhood character before we get into a situation where not in my backyard can become the loudest voice. Um, the other thing is on the, on the doing side, uh, part of it is building. And my question is, you know, what can we do to advocate more and obtain more of a fair share of state funding? Uh, they're delivering mandates, but there needs to be some way to look at that. And then finally, um, the BMP program, the, P, the Planning Commission had a good look at it recently and made some recommendations. 
And unfortunately, the 120% uh, cutoff has some unintended consequences and uh, more people will be in the pool and therefore the low and very low may have less of a chance. So we made several recommendations uh, to address that, including awarding more points for low and very low income, uh, recognizing the income of gig workers, which are currently not recognized, um, and looking at whether professional preferences are working against providing affordable housing to those who are really uh, in need. And then finally, to try to increase the production by looking across the state, seeing whether it's possible to actually increase the percentage that's required uh, of developers and perhaps as much by uh, 10%. I know it's not a huge number, but every unit would make a difference. Profits have increased as prices have gone up. We should take a look at communities across the state uh, to have a look and see whether it's possible to increase the number of units. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great comments. And the council will be considering the Planning Commission's recommendations on the BMP program on October 6th. So let's now move to some of our written questions. Uh, we did have a question um, about how West Valley Community Services is funded. We have a diverse funding source. Uh, we get support from the cities we serve. So um, Town of Los Gatos supports us with grant funding. We get funding from the county. Uh, we write grants, foundation grants, um, corporations support us. Um, and we also do active fundraising. And there are a lot of, a lot of um, individual donors um, who also support us in our effort. That's great. And the, the town has been um, one of your grantees for, for quite some time. We've been yes. in that partnership for, for a while. So, and we just so, so appreciate that. Um, another question for, uh, for you has to do with just a clarification. You mentioned the statistics of 160 families in Los Gatos using the rental assistance. And there was just a clarification that is just for Los Gatos, correct? So the 162 that I mentioned were new clients from Los Gatos who accessed our services. This could be inquiry, food, or anything. Out of that, 52 households received some form of financial assistance, either towards rent, PG&E, um, or any other like car repair or any past due uh, bills. Okay, thank you. And then we received a comment from one of our participants that asked how the town is collecting information and input from the developer community um, on how to build effectively and efficient to create more housing that is affordable, not just through the BMP restrictions, but also affordable by design. This is quite a long comment, um, but the, the speaker clearly has a fair amount of experience and the bottom line is that there is a hope that the town can get some independent economic advice as to the feasibility of various housing uh, building types uh, before we lock into them. And, and there's comments about specific heights and what it would take to achieve um, the particular density um, you know, in, a, in, a, in a particular development. So I know the commenter had raised their hand earlier um, and then withdrew their hand. So. Uh, so that comment is there and staff will take a closer look and we'll probably follow up with that particular participant uh, as well as other stakeholders to make sure we are getting um, getting the input from the builder community. And now, and now is the especially good time to be putting in your input in as we go through the general plan update. Um, you know, when that land use element comes forth, we would hopefully, you know, they will know that and be putting in their their comments uh, regarding any land use uh, issues that should be looked at and changed, especially since he does talk about height and his his questions, and, and that that's kind of what I think we need that input. You know, you, you might think that you know raising the heights by ten or five or ten feet would would promote more housing in that mixed use area, but that might not be do us any good at all. And so we we've done a policy change that 
didn't reduce those barriers that I talked about earlier. So hopefully we'll, we'll get that type of input while we go through our general plan update. And I would just offer, you know, there, there's a number of factors, obviously, you know, height, density, those are big factors, um, but just process um, is a huge factor. Um, those developers who have to carry the cost as it goes through the process, um, those, are, those are very significant issues, um, but we definitely will um, look at opportunities to reach out to, you know, the local and regional architects, developers, builders, make sure that, you know, we either meet with them individually as a group collectively. I know I've offered multiple times to meet with local architects to, to walk through challenges that they've had over the years um, and then make sure that we get notice to them as we start moving into the land use element and community design element so that, so that we can get that input. Excellent, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Kinsey, let's, we're gonna move back to our live questions. Uh, Kinsey, you're, you're next. Uh, hello. Um, I just wanted to start off by thanking all of you for facilitating this meeting, and I'm glad that we have this platform to discuss such an important issue. Um, I'd just like to make a few comments and hear your thoughts. Uh, race and socioeconomic status are inextricably linked. We've established that. In 2015, 67% 16, of new homeowners were white, and less than a quarter of them were either Black or brown brown across the United States. The same study posited that rental unit residents were the most diverse, diverse demographic. Um, from a logistical standpoint, relative to, rent, to a rental unit, a single family home requires a larger plot of land per housing unit and usually a higher income level. Seeing as there's a dearth of affordable housing in our town and, a land, and land is a limited resource here in Los Gatos, I strongly urge governing institutions to question the limitations of single family housing development practices. Uh, secondly, though the current BMP in Los Gatos is certainly an effort with the right intent, local government should research alternative methods of re uh, reaching affordable housing requirements. Public housing, rent control, nonprofit housing, and cooperative housing are all promising options that we sh should consider. These methods are direct approaches to affordable housing that help discourage in-lieu fees and increase affordable housing in the near rather than distant future. Uh, and finally, along the same line of thought, conducting an AB1 1600 study would be an informative step in creating stricter policies regarding in-lieu fees. In analyzing these fees from previous years, Los Gatos could more accurately gauge how much a developer must reasonably pay to promote affordable housing or how much would differ deter developers from avoiding the development of units for lower income levels. Uh, thank you again for taking the time to listen to some of these ideas. Thank you, great, great comments. Um, good, good suggestions. Uh, Los Gatos is a rent controlled city um, consistent with state law. So we have some of those elements in place but there's always room for improvement. So thank you for those many ideas. Uh, let's move to Amy. Thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you for holding this forum. Very much appreciated. Um, I guess I have some specific questions uh, that didn't, I put them in the Q&A, but I guess it didn't get seen by anybody. <laughs> um, and one thing I want to mention is um, the in lieu of fees, uh, it seems like there needs to be a larger barrier to actually preventing developers from just taking advantage of that instead of actually, you know, don't take advantage of that and actually build the affordable housing instead of just postponing it indefinitely. And it sounds like there's probably a sizable amount of in lieu in fees since so many developers take advantage of it. Uh, so I have a couple of questions. One, um, can these fees be used to, existing fees that have been collected be used to perhaps purchase um, existing units within existing apartment property uh, to designate as affordable housing? Because that's a lot quicker than building new ones just for a short-term solution. Uh, so that's one question. Second question is regarding ADUs, um, what would be the incentive for a private property owner, um, I guess such as myself, 
to actually build an ADU, which would go into the affordable housing designation. Um, so do we have incentives for that, given that, let's say, hypothetically, it would cost me, I don't know, 300 grand to build like a 750 square foot unit in my property. Um, what would be my incentive for doing that? And are there any? Um, and the third one I will mention, and then I'll probably specifically email to Paul, or I mean, Joel Paulson is, and um, in my neighborhood, there has been an empty uh, housing unit, which was supposed to be a single family house. And the owner decided to make it a multifamily unit, which was at the time against the law. So it's been sitting there for at least 20 years, if not more. Um, and I will email that and perhaps it's just one unit that could be looked into. Why is that still sitting there abandoned? Uh, yep, so those, those are my questions that I hope to get an answer to about the ADUs and what's being done with the existing in lieu of money that you have and how are you going to raise that barrier? Thank you. Thank you for the questions. And we did see your questions in the chat. We just oh, have okay. <laughs> questions in the chat, so we haven't gotten to them yet. Um, but since you asked them live, we'll go ahead and, and answer them, them now. So Joel, do you want to start off and help answer some of the issues that Amy has raised tonight? Yeah, I'll give it a shot. Um, I have a 95% chance of knowing which house she's speaking about that might be on the corner lot um outside of the downtown off north santa cruz avenue but i could be wrong um regarding in lieu fees you know for many years and i'll actually get the um, actual uh, last time we took in in lieu fees for something other than a hillside property um, the majority of our in lieu fees um, in recent past have been from hillside residential properties um, that creates its own issues with building BMPs in the hillsides. Um, but that aside, I'll get that actual date of when the last, you know, in lieu fee was paid. And we have, again, continually evolved our guidelines to try to make it more and more difficult um, for developers to use in lieu fees rather than providing units. I know we've had, you know, only one or two um, use creative solutions of actually purchasing offsite units. Um, and making those designated BMPs. And so those are some other things that folks have done. Um, I think we do have um, in lieu fees and that uh, I wanna say it's around three and a half million dollars. Um, we have looked at those ideas of purchasing existing units. I think the challenge is that pot of money, frankly, won't go very far in town. Um, even if we're buying smaller condominiums, um, you can't necessarily buy apartments. You'd have to buy the whole complex. Um, however, we did in the past, you know, consider um, an option of maybe buying down affordability for apartments. Um, that never really got off the ground. But, you know, we actually did a document, a planning document, looking at use of those funds and creating more affordable housing opportunities. And that was one of the ideas that I recall from that document. Um, as far as incentives, um, we do have the potential for incentive programs if uh, individuals want to deed restrict their properties so that they have to be rented. Um, and my recollection is that it is a low cost um, construction loan. Um, I don't recall that it is for the, for the full amount. Um, the other incentive that we provide is that we, we which is, I will admit, um, not a great incentive as far as the total cost, but we will pay for the um, application fee for the accessory dwelling unit. Um, but those are a couple thoughts. The one for the fee I know is in place. The one for the potential for loan has been discussed in the past. I just don't know that we've actually implemented that one yet. Um, and I can't remember, Ms. Prevetti, if there were other items that she was looking um, if I could jump in for a sec, uh, Laurel and Joel, thank you very much. Um, 
I'm going to suggest that we do post on the website as part of the follow up for this our afford our affordable housing uh, fund information and our resolution and policy with respect to that. So yes, in lieu fees are problematic and that will come before uh, the council on October 6th, the policy committee consisting of myself and the vice mayor. Thank you very much. He's listening and is quite an expert on this topic. Um, we discussed that in lieu fees right now and some other fees connected with housing go into what's called it, what's a dedicated affordable housing fund for the town. It has about $3.2 million in it. It could be used for a variety of purposes, advocacy, buy downs, rent control. Um, as a very specific example, the, you heard about the four unit teacher housing um, that is now being proposed and hopefully will be constructed soon. The town was able to make a loan out of that affordable housing fee to help with those units getting constructed. So those are the kinds of things that we can use those funds for. But as Joel correctly points out, uh, 3.2 million doesn't go a heck of a long way, but it, it goes some way. So we have used it in the fees for that. So sorry for that, um, Laurel. Um, if we could post the, that information on the website, I think it'd be helpful. Yeah, we'd be happy to post it. And then we're also going to post a link to the staff report for the October 6th meeting. So those of you who are concerned about changes to income requirements and other metrics can also share your comments there. So the mayor actually addressed one of the questions that was in the Q&A with respect to the teacher housing and how we were able to get that project off the ground. Um, so it is, it's, a, it's a tough model because the town basically gave the land as well as um, a loan from the BMP in lieu fees to help uh, with the construction. So our, as Joel says, our dollars don't go too far, but I think our town council is putting the money uh, where, where its values are with respect to, uh, to teacher housing. And I think there's, there's a lot of interest to replicate that, um, but we are gonna need additional funding, funding sources. Um, another question has to do with Rena. Um, this gets very technical, so please bear with me as I just read the question. As long as the total number of affordable housing is met in the current Rena cycle, regional housing needs allocation, quantities at different affordability levels were targets. How will this change in the next cycle? Will quantities per affordability level be more of a requirement rather than a goal? And what kind of changes are we expecting to see? So I think Mr. Schultz is probably way better versed in the legal portion of this, but I'll, I'll, I will say that the state law has changed where we will have to target specific um, levels and if we don't meet those levels with the designated site that is part of our inventory that's going to get to what uh, Mr. Schultz mentioned about the no net loss so then we will have to designate another site to accommodate those units um, so that's really going to be a significant and different challenge from the last housing element cycle um, which will create some challenges for us um, as we um, move forward. and before Mr. Schultz starts uh, I just want to give some history and background when we did our last um, housing cycle, it's called the cycles that the, the regional government has when they give us requirements for regional housing needs assessments and we, need, we get assigned a number and we do something. Um, one of the strategies that we did was to uh, develop what's called an affordable housing overlay zone. So we encourage uh, housing in a particular area. And those things need to get reviewed by the state um, housing and community development bureau, bureaucratic, whatever. Interestingly, the uh, public committee that worked on that suggested uh, designating different income amounts for some of the houses to, that would potentially get built there. And it got rejected. Um, I'm sure the climate has changed, but the theory was that by imposing these requirements, we could actually impose barriers. So the developer comes in and says, I can't, can't build 50, you know, very low, but I can build 20 middle. So I think maybe Mr. Schultz will talk about how the laws may have changed, but these are interesting discussions about, well, you think you have really good intentions and somebody tells you, well, that could actually be a problem. So anyway, back to my, my uh, original comment, this is really complicated. 
Mr. Schultz, help me out. <laughs> it's a very complicated subject. I was just trying to get it down to its lowest level of what I see up at Sacramento is the legislation they're trying to pass is okay as we've given you your arena numbers and yes, you've planned for those units, but then we could done with the cycle and you didn't uh, develop those. There wasn't the development that you said is possible or could occur. And so it's like SB 35, you're gonna see legislation that basically when you don't meet your arena numbers, they're gonna take away your discretion. And that's what we don't want to happen because then it's all by right, it's ministerial, and we don't get to pick where we want that development to occur and how we want it to occur at what density levels. And so that's what we don't want to be in that position where there's legislation that's being forced. I mean, that's where Cupertino is with SB 35. Um, and, and so that's the issue we have to be aware of is, is what are those barriers, all good intentions, you know, we think we've developed something that will allow that property to be developed, but in, in fact, it, it was, there were still barriers for it to be developed. And that's where we do not want to be. We need to do more than just plan. I mean, that's the, if you want to call it a game, that's the game that's been played for the last 20 years is everybody said, okay, we've, we've planned for these units. We did what we needed to do. Uh, leave us alone state. And now state saying, no, you, you, you still need to plan for them, but if you don't meet your numbers, then there'll be repercussions. And I think we're gonna see more and more of that type of legislation up in Sacramento. And I would just add, you know, the other challenge that, you know, the town's gonna to have is, you know, it was a, a challenge to say the least to come up with the sites for our sites inventory for the last cycle. And there is legislation that has made it infinitely, infinitely more difficult to reuse those sites in the next cycle, unless you get to, as Mr. Schultz mentioned, buy right development, up zoning um, and things like that, which which historically have been challenging in town, but it's going to be extremely difficult to to accommodate the greatly increased numbers that we're going to be looking at in this next cycle. Just to add to that, I don't know, Laurel, can I? Please, please. Um, and and thank you. Um, uh, all of you, I mean, this is so critical. I mean, most of the time, you know, when we question is why are these um, um, policies coming in and why are state taking control? I think that's happening is when we are very short sighted um, in our decision making, uh, especially with affordable housing, uh, we have to think about future and how the, how the town or the cities needs to shape in. And so it's very critical that if whatever policies and decisions we make, it has to be long sighted so that the states don't control. Um, and we don't want that. We don't want state to take control of it. But for that, um, you know, we need leaders and, and forums like this and community coming together um, so that we can have policies and visions which are long sighted. And in the, in the only in the past few years that because now we are worried about these legislations that we have started looking like that in that in, with that vision in mind. But um, even with um, the city of Cupertino being involved in it, this whole thing has been like where the where there couldn't be an agreement and then SB 35 had to come in. So it's very critical that open conversations and dialogues happen so that we can make um, a community informed, um, socially responsible decision working together as leaders um, and nonprofits and community members instead of state throwing a legislation to make this happen. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. That's great. Um, okay, I want to go back to any live speakers who have not yet spoken. Um, I see a, a hand that has already spoken and I would just encourage you to type in your question uh, in the Q&A. Um, and uh, okay, we have a new person who has not yet spoken, uh, Heidi Owens. So I'm curious for your thoughts about including race as one of the point criteria in the below market program. Um, up until just recently, it was mandated at the federal level um, under the Obama regulations that race had to be a criteria for affordable housing programs if the entity received um, housing and urban development or HUD funding. That was just repealed by Trump a few months ago. So now it's not mandated, but it's certainly legal. And 
um, considering this forum came out of the Black Lives Matter protests, I really think we need to include race. So I just would love to hear your thoughts. Okay, and you um, have a couple other questions. So let me just toss all of those out for our speakers. Uh, the other question is why isn't LGBTQ included as a point in the BMP? And why is law enforcement included at six points, but then Los Gatos Monasterino police officers are excluded? Is that because uh, so they don't get the full 12 points. So there, there's some other questions from the commenter in, in the chat um, that you can also tackle. So I'll start. Um, yes, I believe she's correct because as town employees, then they would be getting double points uh, from the police officer perspective. I believe there was some committee, um, if I remember. And as far as the other criteria, I think those are great uh, input and those are things that the council could consider um, including in the BMP point criteria when they consider BMP guideline modifications on October 6th. Great, thank you. Are there other people who would like to raise their hand and ask a question live? If not, um, we'll go back to, we've got quite a number of questions still in the chat. Another question is that uh, it's uh, the individual's understanding that the town used its redevelopment money to build the library. Did the town use any of the redevelopment money to build affordable housing? So by law, the redevelopment agencies, 20% had to go towards affordable housing and the other 80% could be used for community projects. So the library was built with that other 80%, the 20% uh, I think part of that 3.2 million is probably still a little bit left over that. I don't think it's all in lieu fees, but I don't know that answer for sure. The properties we did buy with that 20% in the redevelopment agency would be the Ditto's property, and it would be the property on Main Street behind um, where uh, Charlie's is and where Pizza My Heart, uh, part of that parking lot was purchased with it. I don't know if there was any other specific properties that were purchased with that 20%, uh, but we could certainly find that information of, of, of um, what, what other properties were bought. Joel might have a memory of if we've actually purchased, but those are the two main uh, major purchases that I'm aware of. And, and uh, we still own the property behind um, the pizza of my heart. Yeah, I'd have to go back through some of the old redevelopment agency five-year plans and budget documents from prior to 2011 or nine. I can't remember when it dissolved, um, but we probably used it for some of the other uh, Habitat for Humanity did a house. We might have used funds for that, but we can definitely look into that and get that information. And 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 I'll say this is is and I I can't remember if the legislation passed or not. It wasn't on my list there, so I forget which ones passed sometimes and which ones got bogged down, but there was legislation and I'll check on it. And that in many jurisdictions that purchase property with redevelopment dollars and with affordable housing reasons um, are still sitting there, kind of like ours is, it's being used as a parking lot and not for affordable housing. So there was legislation and I believe it passed that we're gonna have to do a report each year to the state stating what our properties are and what our plan is uh, to make it affordable else they can come in and, and, and take it. So, you know, I'll, I'll follow up back on that, whether it passed or not. And if need be, then that's something we're going to have to bring to council. Uh, we have in the last five years had a plan and had many, many meetings on a public private partnership with a garage with affordable plus market units and didn't get across the finish line and didn't get a, you know, approved. Um, but certainly with or without the state law, we need to figure out what we, what we should be doing with that property and what's the affordable housing component uh, that should be put on that property. Great, thank you. Um, we know that SB 50 has been an evolving bill um, that Senator Weiner has introduced and reintroduced and it keeps being modified. One of the premises of the bill is that density should occur where there is infrastructure, particularly transit. Does Los Gatos have transportation areas that would qualify 
under any of the proposed SB 50 options? So, you know, again, I'd have to look at the last iteration the definition of, of near a transit area continually evolved and changed um, with different amendments. My, the last amendment, I don't believe we would qualify under that because we did not have the transit uh, area in anywhere in town that would have uh, applied 50. Joel might remember the last iteration of whether it would apply, but I don't believe it would have applied at the last iteration, but in certain iterations, it certainly would. All you would need is uh, bus service and, and we would have, but the transit area, I think in the last iteration of it required more than just standard bus service. Okay, thank you. Um, let me just see if there's anyone else from the live uh, raise your hand uh, option. If we still have questions in the chat that we'll get to, but I know there may be some of you who have um, who may want to speak uh, instead of having your question answered in, in the written form. Give it a minute. Okay, then we're going to move on to a couple of questions asked by one community member. Uh, and some of these are comments, so please note them. Many Los Gatos residents that earn good income currently, including baby boomers, will be retiring and moving away from Los Gatos uh, and away from their children to more affordable housing. So that, that is a comment. And then there was a question about, can we put in a plan for an active adult community similar to the Twin Oaks and Hollister? It includes single family homes from 1,000 to 1,300 square feet, a clubhouse and many activities within the community. Have we, have we ever seen a proposal like that for Los Gatos? Not that I'm aware of. And I think, again, getting back to some earlier points, you know, we can provide the opportunity for a property owner or developer to create that type of development, but that's not something the town can, um, you know, we don't have the funds or property to kind of develop that on our own. Um, you know, that gets to be something probably in our current regulations, a potential for a planned development um, to come in on a larger piece of property to try to accommodate those varying uses. Um, and so that is definitely a possibility, but I don't recall uh, in the last 20 years is my limited history, um, anything of that nature coming through. Great, thank you. Um, so good comments and we will be summarizing all of them for council consideration. Uh, we had some questions that were repeated uh, within the chat. Uh, so we won't belabor the, that point, but we did have another question regarding the in lieu fees and how they're calculated. And has the town considered one indexing those fees to the market price of the unit that they would otherwise be creating Two, limiting the number and allocating them by some sort of auction between developers or three establishing a cap and trade analogy where developers are rewarded for adding affordable homes beyond the minimum. So generally the BMP fees when they're allowed to be used is 6% of the building valuation um, for the entire project. So um, that is the calculation that's currently used. If we wanted to modify that to some other metric, um, then we would need to do a nexus study um, and so that is something that will probably come up uh, when we go to council. Um, similarly, and I can't recall the topic, but there was another item that would also require a nexus study. Um, but typically, we could make any of those modifications or choose any of those options. We would just have to get some um, solid justification through a nexus study to utilize any of those. And, and, and what far, just, just real quick, Mr. Schultz, sorry. As far as cap and trade, the reality is our developments are very small. We're talking about, you know, one to three units typically um, in, a, in a hillside project that would be eligible for in lieu fees. Um, it's more on the order of probably one or two. Um, so that would be, you know, something we could look into, but um, it's, it's not going to generate a significant number of units as a, you know, high or medium density apartment or condominium project would in the flat where we would be requiring them to build those. And so I, I was just gonna let the public know what, it, what, what you meant by a nexus study. The law AP, AB 1600 requires anytime you're going to 
implement a development fee, uh, in this case, the in lieu fee or any other type of fees, you have to do a study and show there's, there's a connection between your fee and how much you're charging to the cost of that. Uh, I think it's something that we definitely should look in. I don't know when the last time we did that study. They're not, they're not cheap to do, um, but certainly uh, enable to, uh, you know, so there's a relationship between the cost and it's not too low to developing that unit. Okay, thank you. The other, the other issue that, be, you know, I know we're starting to get later on, but that I want to bring up, there was one question about, but the BMP unit, bot unit would essentially be dissolved if the home is foreclosed on upon. And, and we touched on, on the issue of, of the problems with home ownership. If the BMP owner uh, increases his, his income, uh, we don't have the ability, they're able to stay in the unit. So that, that is problematic in, in the fact, at least in my mind, when you've got someone that could be making well over the amount that they qualified and they're still in the home, the other situation we do get in with home ownership is, 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 is the person on the other end of the spectrum that they qualified at the time, but now they've lost their job and are even in a, in a worse economic situation and can't pay their mortgage, can't pay the HOA, and the home is foreclosed on. And that is true that if the home is foreclosed on, that we would lose that BMP unit and it could be a windfall, whoever purchased it at a foreclosure sale. We have never let that happen uh, because we do not want to lose that unit and, and, and let someone have a windfall each and every time we have stepped in and because we that's in our deed restrictions that we can step into the shoes of the owner and uh, make the mortgage whole and then foreclose on ourselves and become the owner of it. So we don't, we haven't at least have, I've been here and I don't believe we've ever lost a BMP unit, but it can be very costly to the town to go in and negotiate those those foreclosures and the deed in lieu of foreclosure and then removing the tenant. But we have done that, I think two or three times in my last seven years. So that's, that's just another issue that someone was kind of raising a little bit different about the problems that you can have with home ownership over rental units. Okay, thank you. We do have a couple more questions and then I think we're going to uh, wrap it up because due to time constraints for our panel. Um, we got a comment that the entire community needs to understand the affordable housing issue. There is still anger over approval of the 300 or so units approved at the North 40, which is only half of the town's regional housing needs allocation numbers for just this cycle. We need all types of housing, market right and affordable. The North 40 phase one was a good start. Talking about needing more housing and then condemning the first big attempt to address housing makes no sense. So that, that's just a comment. Um, and then um, another comment towards the end here. Let me just get to it. Um, so there's a question about Los Gatos being self-sufficient. Um, a lot of red flags went up for that individual um, when, when that was said. I apologize, I was probably the one who said that. Uh, what has made Los Gatos self-sufficient in the last 50 or 60 years? And being self-sufficient, did it give Los Gatos an unfair advantage politically and economically, causing other cities historically to be at a disadvantage both politically and economically. This makes it all the more important to collaborate with other cities that are, that are at an unfair advantage. So that way we, can, we don't need to be competing uh, with each other, but rather helping each other. People are, of color are being pushed into a corner by gentrification and also competing for low income housing. So a very thoughtful comment um, uh, that, that was just recently added. And then we, I think we had another comment about um, BMP, but I think we've already addressed, addressed how the BMP works. Um, so I know that uh, not all of you could see the questions this evening. You know, it was really meant to be a tool for those of us who are facilitating the meeting and answering them. But please know that we are going to be producing a detailed summary similar to what we did after the police reform 
community discussion. So you'll see all of the written and verbal questions, Q and A uh, answered. So I, I appreciate everyone's patience. I know I know there's frustration with Zoom, and it would be nice for uh, for everyone to see everything. But um, you know, we've we've tended to be a little bit more conservative in, in how we use this platform. Uh, town attorney, please. Just the one because I did. It was the one I talked about, which is what is the property behind Pizza My Heart designated for? It's currently a parking lot, so it's designated as a parking lot. But because we used affordable housing funds to purchase it, whatever we do with it has to have a component of affordable housing. Uh, there were six units on that property when we purchased it and made it all in the parking lot. So when we do develop, develop it, it has to at least have six affordable units on it. That's our at, at minimum what we'd have to do. Certainly we can create more, but right now it's designated just as public use, public parking lot. Um, but certainly we would rezone it to, and as I said, the project that had moved forward and was pretty far along the stages was a parking lot. It was one underground, uh, one ground level and uh, condominiums above that um, with affordable units. I think there were nine or even more than that of affordable units, if I'm correct. So that's, that's the minimum we'd have to do on that property is six affordable units. Thank you for that clarification. And then a parting comment uh, is that it would be great to bring the diversity of affordable housing to Los Gatos, but with the cost of land so much higher in Los Gatos, why would an affordable housing organization want to build in Los Gatos when they could get cheaper land elsewhere? What could the town do to help? So I'll, I'll start and I'm sure others may have additional comments. What I will say is we've had a number of housing developers over the years actually come in and do projects in town that are all affordable um, housing units. Um, so we have a number of them in the northern portion of town. We have some off Miles Avenue. Um, we have a developer who partnered with an affordable housing developer, which will be doing the North 40 units. Um, and then we've had some other uh, religious um, affordable housing developers or religious organizations um, do some of those over the years. And that's part of that 191 units. Um, you know, the last one, frankly, was was quite a, quite a while ago, um, other than partnering with the private developer. Um, but, you know, that, and it was probably 20 years ago, I would assume, and it was 12 studio apartments. Um, but ultimately, land is expensive. Um, they're looking for opportunities from the state through uh, tax credit financing. They're looking for jurisdictions if they have funds to contribute to help offset those costs. But I think, again, it gets back to you know, the two big levers for most development um, are height and density. So when you run those numbers with the cost of land and the cost to build, and the time and cost of the process, um, it gets to be challenging for those developers. And as mentioned before, you know, I think the town, myself and others, we need to reach out not only to for-profit developers to find out what those barriers are, but also the affordable housing developers to find out what those barriers are. But it's really, you know, it's, it's really their goal to try to bridge those gaps. And they really, I think, do um, want to do things in town in in jurisdictions like the town um, to help bridge those gaps from a diversity perspective because there is such a big gap. Um, and so I'm not sure if Ms. Pervetti has additional comments on that one. No, you handled you handled that great. Thank you. And that pretty much concludes the questions that are in the Q and A as well as the raised hands. I want to thank all of you for participating, asking really thought provoking and very good questions. Uh, I wanna thank our uh, panelists for, uh, for your expertise. And I appreciate that the mayor helped jump in and participate as well um, on this. So um, I think the mayor will close us with some next steps and uh, how you can continue to engage with the town. So thank you all very much. Wonder wonderful questions, wonderful comments. Thank you, Laurel. I'm not, I'm not so sure she's thrilled that I jumped in, but uh, oh well. Um, 
Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to all of our staff who assisted with this as always. Uh, and thanks to everyone who worked so hard to put this together. Uh, thanks to our council members who are all on this uh, Zoom again. Uh, your time and attention to this issue is very much appreciated and will help us go forward on October 6th. As we did with the police, we will develop ideas and listen to your comments and figure out what are those things that the council should be considering with respect to affordable housing or our below market price house housing plan, our metrics, our affordable housing fund, our use of in lieu fees, our collection of in lieu fees. What are the things that we can be doing? And we'll collect all of those and look at them on October 6th. We hope you will join us if you're interested in this topic for our council meeting at seven o'clock on October 6th. And we also hope that uh, through this morass of very complicated affordable housing discussion, uh, one thing that you take away is that your involvement at the ground level at the general plan will make a huge difference because it, the barriers to affordable housing are often boring things like how high can it be? What can the setback be? What is the zoning? The city of Minneapolis recently eliminated single family residential zoning in the Minneapolis completely. Um, to try to get housing units. So it, these are interesting discussions that cities around the country are confronting, that we're confronting. And one of the things um, that we hope to do through these um, community workshops is to do a little bit of education, a little bit of outreach, a lot of listening, and to hope to, as Tijatha said, bring everyone together around a consensus and understand that this is an issue that it affects our friends, our neighbors, our essential workers, it affects everyone. And that by providing these opportunities, we give ourselves, I think, a more diverse, a more inclusive, and ultimately a better and more interesting community. So hopefully, um, you know, that's one person's opinion, but uh, we'll go forward on October 6th with this issue. But uh, our community conversations are going to continue. Uh, with a wrap up on October 22nd, where we are going to discuss the very broad issue of community culture. What is Los Gatos? What do we want Los Gatos to be? What do we want it to look like? And we really look forward to your participation in that event on October 22nd. And so with that, I think, unless Laurel, you have something to add. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and we will see you on the 6th and then hopefully again on the 22nd. And thank you to our panelists for taking the time. We appreciate it. Good night, thank everyone. You. Good night.